morning, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Mastering Diagnostics. We're on episode number 20. I want to talk to you about leveraging the power of emissivity. It's a big word, meaning emissive. Emissivity is the measurement of how well a material surface emits thermal radiation. And what I mean by that is this. If we go back to what we've been discussing for years, you and I, about work being performed, typically in an automobile, work is performed through the use of electricity. And it's the electrical current flow that creates magnetism. And the magnetism creates physical movement. Or when that magnetism is, that magnetism discharges in the form of a high energy spark. Um, right? That's how we operate in ignition coil. But the point is, anytime work is performed and current flows, um, as this work performs and current flows across resistance, we get voltage drop. And with voltage drop, of course, there's a correlating heat factor. Well, through the power of thermal imaging, I'm sure we've all heard of by now, we can capitalize on this heat signature, this emissivity taking place within the circuits that are functioning or the components that are functioning. And to leverage the power of thermal imaging means you and I can have another tool in our tool belt. We can leverage it to accomplish our jobs diagnostically a lot easier. So whether we are leaning on thermal imaging entirely to make a diagnostic decision, or we're using it as an additional, what I like to call a second or third arrow in the target to confirm what we believe we already know, right? Action, reaction, or comparative measure, maybe maybe one component to another and, and them being similar components, both supposedly functioning, should emit a, a very similar heat signature. Um, we could use this information to help corroborate other test results. So first, I want to thank uh, Snap-on Diagnostics for loaning me this diagnostic thermal imager. This is going to allow us to capture the power of emissivity to make diagnostic decisions. And there's some really cool features that this device offers that not a lot of other devices offer. But there are a million devices out there and uh, many options for you to choose from. But this is, a, this is one we're going to be demonstrating in this Mastering Diagnostics episode. So I want to tell you a little bit of a story. Years ago, I was in the shop and we had a vehicle come into the shop. Now, listen, this was this was in the, the heart of the wintertime. It was really cold in my region. There was snow and ice everywhere. And believe me, the last thing I wanted to do uh, was go outside and retrieve this vehicle because I was I was comfortable inside in the warm in the warm shop drinking my coffee. But I went out and, and we got this big Ford. I can't remember. I believe it was an 07 Ford Expedition or maybe it was an excursion. And we pushed the vehicle in the shop. And the reason being is the battery was stone dead. Uh, now we pushed it in the shop and uh, we put a battery charger on the vehicle. And what I saw was with my with my trusty thermal imager, I instantly saw when I opened up the hood that one of the fuses was significantly hotter than the others. And what I mean by that is, if you take a look at this example picture I have right here, the power of emissivity allows us to assign a color to the intensity of heat. So what's captured within the boundaries of this screen of the detected area or heat signatures associated with the components that fall within this image. And the color white is the hottest of all the signatures here, where something closer to blue or purple or darker indicates something that has less heat being emitted from it. So again, back to this photo here, the fuse is significantly hotter than the others, which tells me with my background, my knowledge as an automotive technician, and my knowledge of the physics as current flows through a circuit, anything with resistance is going to create a correlating voltage drop. And with that voltage drop, heat is going to occur because work is being performed. So if I have my thermal imager pointing at this fuse box with maybe 25 fuses or more, and one is significantly hotter than the other, what did I just do? 
I saved myself a bunch of time. I was able to prevent myself from having to go down that path of discovering what fuse houses the suspect circuit responsible for my parasitic drain. So there's a couple of different directions you can go from here. Um, I could choose at this point to go to the service information system and research the wiring diagram to determine which components are on this suspect circuit. Or I can do something a little bit different. And here's what I decided to do. I decided to hang an amp probe across my battery cable. And here's why I did that. Again, going back to our previous discussions, you and I, we know that current flowing through a circuit is going to create a correlating magnetic field around that circuit. And if we capture the magnetic field's intensity through the power of an amp probe and place it on maybe something like a lab scope, or in this case, I chose to use a graphing multimeter, I could take that amperage trace and plot it in graphical format over time. And here's what I noticed. Take a look at this example captured right here. On my graphing multimeter, I plotted out one minute of elapsed time. And what we can see here is rhythmically, and that's the key word, rhythmically, I have a roughly 7 amp pulse. And that pulse lasts for about a second or two before it goes away. And then once again, the cycle repeats itself. And it does it over and over and over again. And it will continue to do this until the battery is too low on charge to fire the starter off. And that's why we have the dead battery. I've noticed the parasitic drain. So let's retrace my steps so far. Parasitic drain, we open the hood. My thermal image shows me a suspect circuit. My amperage capture from the battery cable shows me not only current flow, how high it is, the what we call the amplitude of the current flow, that's significant. The rhythmic pulses is also significant. Those puzzle pieces together told me something of great current flow, consumption I should say, something doing a lot of work, is rhythmically turned on and off. So I just told myself I am looking for a computer-controlled device that is consuming a lot of current. When I then reference the wiring diagram, as you can see right here, the suspect fuse feeds the rear wiper motor. All I did at that point in time was walk to the back of the vehicle and I pointed the thermal imager at the lift gate and it showed the suspect component, the suspect rear wiper motor glowing white hot. Keep in mind, I'm external to the vehicle. No panels have been removed. A door has not even been opened. I am capturing the thermal image, the emissivity, the heat signature coming from the rear wiper motor. And the fact that current flows, but the wiper does not move, told me that the wiper motor itself is frozen. Now, how's that for a hands-off approach? A solidified diagnosis, leveraging the power of emissivity without even touching the vehicle. So what did that do for me? At that point in time, I approached my service advisor and told him of my findings. Of course, I'm going to be compensated for my diagnostic time. I imagine we had roughly an hour of diagnostic time approved. It took me five to 10 minutes. Nothing was taken apart. And here's the best part. When we quoted the customer what it cost to replace the rear wiper motor, he declined the job. As a result, I told him to rectify this problem. We would have to either remove the fuse, if it was a sole fuse, the only component on that circuit, or disconnect the wiper motor. The customer was happy. He paid a minimum amount of diagnostic time. I had a minimum amount of time invested, but got paid for an entire hour. Now, I'm not trying to make it all about money, but the point is it was efficiency. So I want to talk about this thermal imager for a moment. The diagnostic thermal imager from Snap-on is a pretty nifty device. Very lightweight, charges via a USB cable. Um, it has some many cool options, including the ones demonstrated here. It takes only seconds 
to boot up, less than 10 seconds. And we've got menus that allow us to examine components on the powertrain and exhaust system. Body and electrical, chassis and brakes, HVAC. It also even gives you some tips and demonstrations on how to use the device. Not only that, we've got known good and known bad captures. Everything from battery cables and heated seats to rear window defroster, mirrors, window motors, alternators, relays that are stuck, heated steering wheels, window seals, four-wheel drive switches, EVAP solenoids, taillights, seat motors, you name it, the list goes on and on. The point is, even if I was not familiar with emissivity and the technique of proper thermal imaging, the device, the Snap-on Diagnostic Thermal Imager, serves to show you how to do that stuff. It's basically just-in-time training. It is Wi-Fi operated and cloud-based capture storage, which means I can log on to the Internet and upload my files. Whether I decide to store the files internal on a mini SD card or tether it to a PC and upload it or simply connect via Wi-Fi to the cloud, I can store my videos and my images there. The device has an external built-in flashlight so you can see where you are pointing. You can see the image you are trying to capture before you capture it. There are multiple views, basically picture in picture, zoom out, zoom in, and a side-by-side -side feature that allows you to capture the raw image and the thermal image simultaneously. Now, considering how powerful emissivity can be and how efficient thermal imaging can be, you got to understand with every tool, there are limitations. Now, when I say limitations, I don't mean good or I don't mean bad. I just mean there are certain things tools can do and there are certain things tools cannot do. And it's important you and I discuss the limitations of thermal imaging, regardless of which device you choose to use. So for instance, this, this case study, this diagnostic example, uh, if you will, regarding this Ford rear wiper motor, I want you to go back in time and think about how I began that story. It was the middle of winter. It was ice cold outside. And I happened to be living in the Northeast region at that time. However, just several years before, I was living in Southwest Florida and it was 85 degrees and sweltering, or 95 degrees and dry. But either way, with the sun beating down on a car, it tended to be really, really hot. So if I were to open the hood and attempt to capture a thermal image, attempt to leverage emissivity, I might not be as lucky. What I mean by that is this. The amount of heat signature generated from the correlating current flow and voltage drop from that rear wiper motor working may not generate a, an intense enough heat signature to overcome the heat signature already coming from those high under hood temperatures. What am I getting at? Thermal imaging may not have shown me my fault as easily. So you got to understand climate comes into play. Let's talk about environment for a second. Suppose that I reached under the hood with my thermal imager and I was attempting to capture an image of a component, a working component called a relay. Well, just take a look at this image right here. First, I'm showing you a working relay. And as you can see, the heat signature is present. But watch what happens when I slide my hand into the image. That's right. The thermal imager is going to designate the highest heat signature with the whitest of the color. And as a result, my hand, my body heat, roughly 98 degrees Fahrenheit, is indicating a heat signature hotter than that of the relay. As a result, the functioning relay seems to disappear into the background. So we have to be aware of situations like that. One other thing, a very important thing you have to keep in mind is this. Emissivity is the heat signature. Suppose an adjacent component is highly reflective. Picture, if you will, uh, an air conditioning refrigerant line or a receiver dryer or an accumulator. 
if I have a hot exhaust manifold next to an accumulator adjacent to it, the heat signature is going to reflect or bounce off the shiny component. And if my thermal imager is capturing that reflective nature of that shiny component, you guessed it, I'm going to see what appears to be a high intensity heat image on a potentially cold component, limiting my diagnostic abilities or worse, causing me to make a misdiagnosis. So understanding issues like that means we have to take precautionary countermeasures when leveraging emissivity. In other words, take a piece of uh, matte colored tape, like electrical tape or duct tape, for instance, and place it over a component just like this to prevent that reflectivity becoming an issue, becoming a factor in your thermal image acquisitions. Make it a point to leverage a known good and a known bad library to give you an idea of what to expect. This is a good way to acquire some just-in-time training and prevent you from making assumptions about the functionality of a component simply because you have an improper acquisition or you didn't fully understand what the thermal image was trying to tell you. Take it upon yourself to practice on known good vehicles, a non-faulted circuit to understand, to anticipate what good looks like. Because when you understand what good looks like, bad seems to stick out like a sore thumb. With that, then practice on faulted vehicles. As I've mentioned many times in the past, I call this learning with the training wheels on. Take the time to capture information as you usually do. Use that diagnostic data to make decisions about what is faulted with the vehicle. Now, before you fix the vehicle, take the time to capture some suspect images. And now when you repair the vehicle, you've done so because of the diagnostic data you've previously captured and used to come up with a hypothesis not the experimental thermal images you've acquired. Subsequently, when the vehicle was fixed, take some now post captures to show thermal imaging after repair was made. And with before and after, you can come up with a conclusion on what to expect next time. So finally, if you ask my opinion, I'm gonna tell you this. Thermal imaging is an extremely powerful technique if you do it properly. However, I've never hung my hat on one single piece of data Regardless of the type of diagnostics I'm performing, regardless of the vehicle I'm working on, and regardless of the tests or the systems I'm performing those tests on, I use data as a diagnostic puzzle piece. And the more pieces I can acquire, the chances of me assembling a puzzle correctly are a lot higher. And this is how oversights and mistakes are avoided. So what am I getting at? Leverage the power of emissivity through thermal imaging and use it simply as a diagnostic piece of the puzzle. As I mentioned earlier, there are many thermal image devices out there, but this diagnostic thermal imager from Snap-on works very, very well and has some really, really neat features that not only aid in my technical training, but give me back some of my time. Keeps me efficient because now I can store these images in the cloud or I can save them internal to the device. Simple things like not having to go back to my toolbox and get an additional flashlight means it's one less tool I have to carry with me. And the fact that it's lightweight, I can take it out in the, in the parking lot with me. I can, I can do some triage, if you will, some preliminary data gathering before the vehicle is even in the shop and before components are disassembled. So with that, please take the time to do some experiments and see for yourself just how powerful emissivity can be and how we can leverage emissivity with awesome tools like this diagnostic thermal imager from Snap-on. I'm Brandon Steckler, technical editor of Motor Age Magazine, and thanks again for joining me on this episode of Mastering Diagnostics, everybody. We'll see you next time.